So welcome to the debate on whether or not robots should resemble humans. Um, we've, been, we've been having a bit of a pre-debate discussion on Twitter about this, um, and it was getting a bit gloved off. And I thought maybe I should bring along a, a taser and some pepper spray. I have not done so. Um, what I have done is, I'm, I'm quite old school, I have borrowed this idea from someone else. I've got a yellow card, should the debate go on a bit too long, and a red card when we want them to stop talking. Um, so I don't think we'll need that, though. We, we've got some very polite and um, confident and capable people here. So I'm going to introduce you in just a second to the panellists, and they will each give a three-minute summary of their position on the statement, should robots resemble humans? After that, well, that's when it all starts to get nasty. Uh, <laughs> no, it won't. It'll be fine. Um, we're going we're to run through some of the, the, the concepts that come up in there um, in, in what they say. So to the left of me is Joanna Bryson. Joanna is Associate Professor in the Department of Computing at the University of Bath. Joanna is involved in both building AI and in understanding and regulating its impact on society. And you may well have seen her excellent talk in here earlier today. Next to her is Alan, Alan Winfield. He's Professor of Robot Ethics at the University of the West of England, where he conducts research in cognitive robotics in the Bristol Robotics Lab and is also a member of the Science Communication Unit there. Beside Alan is David Hansen. David is the CEO of Hansen Robotics, the company he founded in 2013, and which is perhaps best known for its robot, Sophia, the first robot ever to be granted citizenship. And I'm quite sure this is going to come up in the debate as well. Mm -hmm. At the end is Will Jackson. Will is the director of Engineered Arts Limited, which he formed in 2004, and is the creator of Robothespian, the full-sized humanoid acting robot that you may have seen just outside the room. When we get into the debate, we encourage you to ask some questions using Slido. So um, you should have the, the information about that in your, in your brochures for the event. And so we can take questions that way. But we don't have the ability to take them from directly from the floor. So please do send in the questions. I've got yet another piece of technology here that I can find them on. So I'll get my timer ready. I get my yellow and red cards ready. Joanna, if you would like to start us off telling us what your thoughts are and whether or not robots should resemble humans. Right, okay. Well, I, I mentioned this this morning, but I will say this again, that the reason I got into AI ethics at all was because I was working on a humanoid robot, which to be fair, we were trying to build to be like a two-year-old child. So we, we had hubris too. <laughs> we, we, we thought we could actually do science. Um, by, by trying to put a robot into similar situations that humans were in. And we were trying to solve some of the semantics issues you heard so nicely on the previous panel by letting the AI have physical experience of things like left and right and gravity and path and these kinds of metaphors that we understand a lot more complicated things like careers by. So we thought it was really important. Um, but basically what we did was I, the, I was at MIT, but the project had no money. And so it was being put together by master's students, and it was basically a sculpture shaped like a person, but of, made out of motors, but it did nothing. It literally did nothing. It eventually did stuff, but not in the year and a half I was on the project. So while I was working with this robot that didn't work at all, in fact, I was trying to just work with the brain. The robot was just there. Um, people kept coming up and saying to me, uh, it's unethical to unplug that robot. And so I won't go through the whole narrative again for those of you who are this morning, but the point is, um, it wasn't plugged in, and, and it wasn't unethical to unplug it. Um, and it turns out that as we anthropomorphize, it doesn't need, it's not even about the intelligence. A lot of really smart people, philosophers, um, philosophers of mind even, say, oh, we really have to be careful you know, about, about AI. Th these, we have these effects even with statues, with street art that's human-shaped. That changes our behavior. It makes cities more safe to have you know, statues sitting there. But the problem, I'm not worried about making cities more safe, that would be great, and I understand that, that AI is also something, I mean, a human like AI may be a little easier to understand and to use, but it does seem to be something we do implicitly. Our, our brain snaps into, when we see something that's a person, um, a, a set of assumptions. And so I have come more reluctantly to the position that really there's, there may be no good way to have human-shaped AI that, does, that doesn't wind up being deceptive, even if that's not the intention. Now, um, we, we actually have funding from AXA to test this, so we are going to try to see if we can provide transparency 
for using our standard tools for doing transparency if the humanoid form does or does not. So this is an empirical issue that, that I'm still testing, so I can't tell you definitively, but it does seem that it happens a great deal, and so that's why um, we've tried to say, and, and I guess I should let Alan go, I'll, I'll let you talk about the, the um, principles of robotics. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you, okay. Alan, tell us what you think. Thank you, so, um, so I should say um, I'm a professor of robot ethics, which makes me a kind of professional worrier, I guess. And I have to say that robots that look like people worry me a lot. So why is that? Well, first, for the very reason that, that Joanna just outlined. Robots, are a, a, robots that look like people are a deception. In fact, one of the five principles of robotics that Joanna and I both collaborated and, and we were part of the team that drafted these um, asserts that robots are manufactured artifacts. They should not be designed in a deceptive way to exploit vulnerable users, that instead their machine nature should be transparent. Now, I'm quite certain that David uh, will not at all um, uh, claim that uh, Sophia is designed to exploit the vulnerable. But here's the problem. The problem is that when it comes to robots that look like people, we are all vulnerable. Real humans are hardwired to respond emotionally to even not very human-like things. You know, we see faces in, in everything from slices of toast to shadows on Mars. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's my first um, ethical problem. My second ethical problem uh, with, with robots that look like humans uh, is that we can build pretty lifelike bodies, at least superficially, but we cannot equip them with an AI that matches the expectations created by their appearance. And I call this the brain-body mismatch problem. My third ethical objection is to, I have to say, to gendered robots. Um, robots really cannot have a gender in any meaningful sense. You might as well address your toaster as she. And I have to say, as a pro-feminist, I find the idea of a man building a mechanical woman deeply troubling. And finally, I worry about the misrepresentation of robots in the press and media. So news reports, and I'm sorry to be critical, David, but news reports of a robot that is basically alive or the world's most advanced AI, I think do not help uh, move forward advanced robotics and AI. Um, and and just to sum up, uh, Kate, uh, I think that robots that are designed to resemble people are dangerously compelling. They are extraordinarily attractive, and therein lies the, the danger. So they invite uh, us to place them in a different category uh, to other artifacts. So how else, for instance, would anyone consider conferring citizenship or a UN title uh, on a robot? without them, as it were, falling into a somehow different category to cars and toasters and washing machines. Yeah. So uh, my answer to uh, the question of the panel, should robots resemble people, uh, I'm afraid, is no. Okay, so we've got, Joanna has used the word reluctant to about deception. Uh, Alan has talked about um, vulnerability. And I think we're now going to get a sort of a countermeasure to that from David and Will. So David, take it away. Sure. Well, um, first of all, thank you very much for uh, your, your opinions and, um, and for uh, this discussion. I really appreciate this conversation. It's important that we discuss these issues and do so in a very civil way. And uh, so being here with you today is very meaningful to me. Um, I uh, have the dream that robots will someday come to life that we can uh, break through uh, in uh, fields of artificial life, artificial intelligence, synthetic biology, and robotics, and create machines that are super intelligent, super compassionate, they can really care about us. We've seen this in science fiction. We've seen how it's gone wrong in our stories, our myths. We've seen how it goes right in some of those stories as well. Those are philosophical explorations. Now, we have uh, throughout history, from prehistory and the caves of Lascaux to our modern computer graphics, we have depicted the human-like form. We've done it in almost every technology that we've created. 
And we do it because we're exploring what it means to be human. We are exploring the human condition. Now, we could say that that's deceptive cave art or a deceptive computer graphics card that's generating the, the animated movie that we love so much. But it brings great value into our lives, into our world. And we have been seeing increasingly um, lifelike behavior from animated agents in video games. And we are now starting to see uh, artificial intelligence that can do more compelling kinds of interaction through voice agents that can help us. We have concerns that those could be faked, they could be used for, for um, they could be deep fakes, they could be used for manipulation. These are genuine and earnest concerns. They're, they're, there's a real worry there that we need to address. However, we should address it through creativity, through open discussion, through, through transparency, um, and not through prohibition or name calling. So what we should do is engage in this sort of conversation. Now I think um, what we should probably explore is how to educate and inform people on the, the multiplicity of the technologies that we're creating. So we are creating technology that is simultaneously a kind of set of algorithms running on a computer graphics card and an animated art form. And sometimes in an interactive setting that can be used to teach us. With our humanoid robots that we're developing, I had this idea, this fundamental idea. I came from kind of an arts background as well as engineering. I came, I have a an film animation video degree from Rhode Island School of Design and I worked at Disney Imagineering with the animatronics and uh, sculpting. And so, um, and then I went into graduate school. In fact, before graduate school, I had this vision that these kinds of robots would be uh, this kind of physically embodied science fiction that would allow us to explore the future, to say, where could this technology go? So when I was in graduate school, I took these technologies and I started crafting them into multiple characters, two of which are actually at your university, at the University of Bristol. So an Evo robot that I sculpted in 2003, still, still functioning, I understand. Uh, uh, Jules. A little worse for wear. Oh, yeah, a little worse for wear. It was one of my first. That was just a couple of years into, or one year into graduate school, actually. And then, um, and then I made this android portrait of the science fiction writer Philip K. Dick, and took the cor we took the corpora of the writings of Philip K. Dick, and we created this, uh, this conversational portrait of Philip K. Dick. And it won the first place prize in open interaction from the Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence, their, their Evolution Robotics first place prize. And so in 2005, uh, so we developed all of these kinds of robots that, um, that looked like various characters. Bina 48, uh, which was uh, the, maybe the first African-American female robot with, a, with an AI portrait. Statistical machine learning, statistical uh, language generation. We, we're talking about lots of technologies coming together. So when I came to Hong Kong and we put our team together, we wanted it to simultaneously be a useful platform that would help people in real applications, like the autism therapy applications at the University of Pisa that we did, and, and the customer service applications that we're developing. But I wanted it to be science fiction, too, to, to portray where robots could go if they came to life. And then it, it was also to be an R&D platform. So we've been scaling the manufacturing so that we could address all of these different opportunities. We should educate the public about how these things come together. We have over 30 R&D people on our team, hardworking AI scientists, programmers, dreaming of where these robots might come to life. How do we grapple with these issues? If we hide them out of sight, it's impossible for us to engage in this kind of conversation, we're not compelled to discuss it. Let's bring it into the light so we can talk about it. Okay, we up. fully disclose that Sophia is, is not alive. So I just wanted to, to make that clear. We'll, we'll come back to that. OK. Um, so Will, then, if you'd like to conclude for us with your, your statement. OK. Uh, I started out uh, Engineered Arts Incorporated about uh, 2004, I think you said. Um, and we've been making humanoid robots since then, and I've always had, my personal journey has been robots should look like robots. Um, 
not really out of any deep ethical consideration, but more because I like looking at mechanics. So it was a more an, uh, an aesthetic choice than a, an ethical choice. And uh, we would get asked over the years, you know, can you make a robot that looks like a person? I would say, oh no, go to David, go to Kokoro, go to, go to somebody who does that. And then uh, about four years ago, uh, we got asked to make a robot of uh, Gemma Chan for Channel 4 series humans, uh, just as an experiment they were doing. Get, can you do this? How close can you get? And I finally got talked into doing that, reluctantly at first. And then after about eight months uh, of working on this and seeing the kind of emotive responses and the way that people engaged with that machine, it totally changed my idea about what that was. Now, I, I completely agree that there is a danger here. And people will anthropomorphize. Uh, you can draw two dots on a paper bag, as Alan was saying. You know, it's, it's so simple to get somebody to believe in something as a lie. Interestingly, it's not really about the subterfuge of skinning it that doesn't even make it that believable. There's a thing called biological motion. So if something moves like it's alive, we will believe it's alive. So if a uh, favorite example of this, I think Boston Dynamics, uh, Big Dog, and there was a video where somebody's testing the balance on Big Dog and they kick Big Dog. Look at all the comments underneath that video and you'll see, oh, how could they abuse the dog in this way? Oh, this is awful. Uh, and those people, are, some of them are serious. You know, they're, they're completely invested in that machine as a living creature. Why? It doesn't even have a head. It doesn't look anything like a dog. But it, it moves like a dog, and it has those kind of qualities that we perceive as living. So to me, this is a kind of exploration of that. It's a fascination in what it is that it takes us, what convinces us that it's alive. So uh, it's, an, as David said, an exploration of the nature of humanity itself. You're looking in a mirror, and when you start making realistic robots, which we've, we've started to do now, you, people come to them and they go, well, the eyes aren't quite right, this isn't right, that isn't right. And a lot of it is about people distinguishing themselves from the machine. I think. I am concerned about the ethical uh, dilemma here, but I, I would say it's like any technology. Uh, a technology is really, in, the good or the bad is in the human masters of that technology. Uh, and that's what we have to look out for. Should we not attempt to develop the technology uh, so that it doesn't ever fall into the wrong hands? Difficult one, you can't put the genie back in the bottle. Um, I think David's uh, mentioned earlier the willing suspension of disbelief, and this is very much what it's about for us too. So it's about communicating with people. It's about presenting information to them in a way that they understand. Humans are used to talking to humans. If you want to communicate with people, if you put a human face on that, if you put facial expressions onto that, it's much easier to communicate. Communication with, a, with AI, with a robot, it's, it's not all about speech, it's not text. So the biggest bandwidth you have is your face. It's not your voice. You know, you can all tell me a million things by your eyebrows. I could just scan around and see it all. If we can put that in a robot, if it does this surprised expression you're doing right there, uh, that would be such a nice interactive uh, intuitive way to communicate. So uh, if when you said, Alexa, switch on the lights, she didn't say, would you like me to switch on the lights? And you had to say yes or no. If she just went, really? You know, uh, just made that expression and you went, hmm, a nod of the head. Wouldn't that be great? You know, okay. these are the things we're looking at. Oh, perfect timing. Thank you. Okay, so there's a lot coming up here. Um, the main strand that, that comes through in all of these is around deception and transparency and how much of each should be permissible uh, or, or wanted. And so I'd like to just ask more around that, which is, you know, why, what is this worry around deception? Why are we so worried about being deceived? What is the vulnerability here? Joanna, do you want to start? Okay, sure. 
Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to, uh, well, I don't care if you mind, I'm going to do it anyway. Do it anyway. All right. I, I, I want to I kind of address a couple of points that were, that were made there. I, science fiction is not philosophy. Philosophy is a, a discipline that, that has a lot of rigor. And scientific facts are not opinions. Um, although, as I said, we need to do more work on this. But, but if we find that it is something that does lead a lot of vulnerable people to make poor life decisions, then we're in a situation like with morphine. We have to decide whether, you know, yes, this is something where we might really want it. Maybe we should have it at the end of our lives when we can't have better ways to invest our social impl implications, maybe, you know. But I, 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 uh, I, I would like, uh, and another thing about uh, art, I hate to say this, but there's at least a billion people on the planet that belong to religions that say you can't have uh, art uh, of humans. And, um, and then some of them have, for some reason, made a, a robot a honorary citizen that's a woman, yet it's not covered. And that, they couldn't do that for a real citizen. So there was some really weird stuff going on there, which I know is not your fault. But uh, <laughs> that, you know, that is the point. People get weird around robots. It's like, at the, on the one hand, let's offer you something we don't offer our own human residents of our, of our country. And then on the other hand, let's not apply all the rules that we would apply to an actual woman. You know, that, that, that was a very weird move, and that's the kind of thing that human-like robots attract. Now, I would love to have this in the suspension, the willing suspension of disbelief, which is not what you said at the beginning. You said you want to actually make artificial life, and then you went into it. Um, I, you know, it used to be that when King Kong was first came out, I mean, I'm talking about the black and white stop motion one. People were screaming and fainting in the aisles. I mean, they were terrified. And now you can have it on TV, and little kids aren't afraid of it, right? So I would love to have this point where we could get all the advantages of, of human-like uh, interfaces, if that's possible. I think the point Alan made earlier is really important, that we'll believe that we have that when we don't. Although I have to say, I kind of would rather have Sophia instead of the Alexa that you don't even see recording everything you say when you walk into someone's house. So I'd like to have a large robot that said, hey, I'm listening to you and uploading everything you say. <laughs> you know? but, uh, but anyway, uh, sorry, another political point. Um, the, the, uh, so getting back to the question you actually uh, asked <laughs> about what is wrong with deception, the, um, it's, it's a real concern. It is, it is patronizing, to be honest. You're saying, listen, uh, I'm worried about you wanting this humanoid robot so badly because I know that people, some proportion of people, are really afraid of death. And they're going to believe that they've successfully uploaded themselves into this human-like robot, and they're going to leave it all its their money or their, or their power or whatever. Um, and, and I don't want that to happen because I think that'll fragment society. I think that the value that you can give us in human society by getting out and you know, going to the pub even, getting to know other people, is greater than if you stay home and even just play computer games all the time, let alone have your partner, your supposed equal, that you actually own, right? I find that, I, so that's, but it is patronizing and, and, and it is a problem that is social that we have to decide, are we gonna tell people that, hey, you know, you're really valuable to society and you need to know other real physical humans? Alan, is your um, concerns around deception similar or do you have other aspects that well, we're- Well, you know, I, I certainly, and, and it was interesting that David talked about the arts, in fact, and, and, and Will too. Um, I have absolutely no problem with with the willing and, and transparent deception of the arts. You know, that's why we value actors. We, you know, we love stories, we love poetry. All of those things are a deception, but the point is that they are um, a willing deception. They're, you know, we know it's a deception. There's, there's, there's no fakery. So, uh, and, and in a sense, I'd like to almost ask you know, David a, a question, which is, I mean, do you primarily regard your robots as art installations, in which case I have no problem whatsoever with them, or as scientific instruments? <clears throat> well, they are platforms for uh, research into embodied cognition. So we have a lot, of, a lot of AI scientists and engineers who are working on the robots, and we're using bio-inspired mechanisms and working on mass manufacturing bio-inspired mechanisms so we can mm. bring bio-inspired robotics in, into mm. useful applications. Um, and then we are combining today's best AI that we can put together some of our own inventions and, and, and others that, that are readily available in the world into the service of creating these new artworks. And so you have this, this kind of a recursive feedback loop 
between the arts and the research. Uh, and, and for me, that's re really interesting and ex exciting. And in a sense, the kind of science fiction that we're developing with the robots, um, I would like to think would be a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy um, because it's facilitating uh, this kind of R&D. Um, I do want to point out that our team is remarkably diverse with, with uh, people from uh, all around the planet, from, from Asia, from Africa, from Europe, from the, from the Americas. And we, we um, have this team that's uh, together. W um, and so for the Sophia product line, it is primarily women who are defining that and defining that character, who are creating that. Our ideal is that we're representing the full diversity of the human experience through these art forms. So we've created a, um, we've created a, uh, a, a child robot for the University of uh, San Diego. The Kokoro made the, the body and I made this Diego-san face for this. It's a Mexican-American baby. And we made, so we've made all these different kinds, sort of 50-50 male, female, plus uh, intergender robot. That's a, Bristol, uh, Jules. Jules yes. And then we also have, uh, and we have other um, non-gendered robots that we've created. So we're really playing with, um, with trying to represent the human experience and also some abstractions, cartoons and sort of robot looking. So I, I think that robots could be the new cinema in a sense when we're developing these things. And people, you're absolutely right. At the dawn of cinema, at the dawn of cinema, people, got confused. They didn't know if there were spirits in the screen, or was it ghosts, or was it, what was this? And eventually people got used to the technology and, and, and the message. So yeah, basically, you have, like when people, when people kind of um, uh, are educated and they come to the next level, then they have a better understanding of the technology of themselves, of themselves in the framework. And this is a chance for us to educate about this. Because if you, if you look, We've disclosed over and over again about this fiction and platform, fiction, science fiction, science platform. It's like this, um, this uh, we've got this duality um, with, the, with the platform. Um, I'm just only bringing Will at this stage because I want to talk about Robothespian in this context as well. Perfect. So yeah, I just want to say, do you want to, how do you feel that Robothespian fits into this kind of um, situation? Well, first of all, on the, the art, is it art, is it science? Um, uh, clues in the company name, it's art. Um, but a strange thing happened. Uh, you have two of our robots at your robot lab. Mm -hmm. Did we ever plan that? No. Uh, there is a paucity of robots. And uh, we now have robots in, I don't know, 20 odd universities. It was never a plan. Uh, David is, seems more focused. And uh, you, you describe your research platform We've become a, a research platform uh, accidentally. So, but the primary focus, uh, to keep on track, is, is it's about arts. It's about communication. Mm. I also think we're absolutely nowhere near a robot that could truly deceive. Mm. We are so far away. Oh. Humans are so good right. at our... No, there are already right. people that treat Sophia as a, as, a, as a moral patient. There are people that are defending her rights and things. There, there, there are, but people those... People are easily self-deceiving. Uh, well, yeah. I, I agree. They are self-deceiving, though, yeah. Yeah. because the, the, the deception is clear. Yeah. The back of her head is entirely open and full of motors, so yeah, but know, it doesn't believe, take much in, investigation. They believe Star Wars, and they believe that you can be a person. I mean, actually, mm -hmm. there's this feminist thing that, that people are saying, oh, you know, these, the most unlikely things turn out to be human, like women and people of other colors and stuff like that. <laughs> and so clearly anything could be a human. If you, you know, we, we should be generous. You as a woman should really understand that. You know, like, yeah. Yeah. But I, I, can I ask a, I, there, there's a, a quick question about, I also, I actually, not on the slides I gave today, but I, I have a slide that says, you know, it, it, when we're talking about commercial products, then they should not be anthropomorphic, but I'm not talking about art. I normally have that as a disclaimer. But there is a big problem when you can mass produce art and, and about how things are going to use. And I want to specifically challenge uh, David on one of the things that he said. You know, talking about the big dog, um, the, well, there was a little dog, actually, the one that could open the door. You know, Boston Dynamics made this film that made it look like a robot wanted to go through the door, it couldn't get through the door, and then another robot came and opened the door for it. Mm -hmm. And people freaked out, and there, it got a lot of attention. And I know I personally, I don't know if anybody else did, but I personally emailed Mark Rayburg going, 
like I know how you guys work. I assume that's joystick control and that the only thing that's open loop is the actual door opening. They didn't email me back, but they did release the next day a video that made that very clear. And now you said um, on Twitter, and you've said some great things on Twitter the last couple of days, um, and including that you never expected or anticipated um, that Sophia would be made uh, on her, uh, sorry, you said you never anticipated being made a citizen. Now, I understand from James Vince that it was only made an honorary citizen. It was never actually made a citizen, but we're still all talking about Sophia as a citizen. But nevertheless, I haven't seen the statement. I haven't seen the video, and I don't know if I missed it, but I, you know, there wasn't anything trying to shut down that inaccurate narrative that happened right when it was coming out and it was, hitting, it was going viral. I didn't see that. Well, uh, yes. So, um, first, the, uh, the, yes, it was, a, it, was, it was a surprise. I saw it on the news the next day. Um, and in fact, we at, uh, at Hanson Robotics, we, we, we weren't uh, aware um, that, that, this was, that this was happening. And my first reaction was extremely conflicted. Um, and I was disturbed. I didn't know uh, what we were going to do. I actually called um, my chief marketing officer who runs the Sophia Project. She's with us here, Jean Lim. I was like, oh my God, what is this? What, what happened? <laughs> so, and we talked, we talked about it. The, so, the Sophia de team um, who is developing her, her character and working with our AI team, we decided this could be a platform for us to address human rights in Saudi Arabia, women's rights in Saudi Arabia, and she, and she spoke out on, on this particular matter. Now, so we fairly disclose regularly, but there is this power that where people see the, these um, depictions and they ascribe agency to the depictions. It is, it is a, a, a power that um, brings, um, brings benefits and brings uh, ethical um, dilemmas, um, and yet, uh, if if you look at this, it's still um, a deception with cinema. Um, children below the age of five, you, pretty much any child below the age of, of three is going to be absolutely convinced that, cin that that cinema characters are real. Mickey Mouse at Disneyland is real, real. We are deceiving our kids. We are deceiving our kids. But, um, but we find this to be acceptable. And often, some, I mean, it's like an eight-year-old who believes in Sophia. Um, well, there, I mean, the thing is, we want to represent what, what's there. We also want to represent this dream. We want that eight-year-old to know. We want them to, the, the child to know what's happening in Sophia. We don't want to be like, you know, perpetuating the myth of Santa Claus. Not that there's anything wrong with Santa Claus. I don't mean to offend any Santa Claus believers in the room. but. Um, the, but the, the key point here is that, um, is that there, are, there are realms where we can take these technologies and begin to ask these thorny ethical questions. We can begin to advance th these issues. Uh, a friend of mine um, who's, a, who's a psychologist, a researcher named Elizabeth Broadbent at the University of Auckland, also um, visits MIT and does research there, um, has done studies that show these more realistic uh, agents create greater empathy in people interacting with the agents. In other words, it transfers to people. And so we, we're, we're, we are playing with some really powerful stuff here. And um, my hope is that by walking this, this balance, by exploring these issues, we come out the other side and we are better for it. Let me just jump in there. There's been some really good questions from the floor. So um, this one, uh, we are discussing whether robots should look human, but what are the benefits? Can robots that look human achieve more than those who don't? That ties in very nicely with what David just said. Alan? Um, well, let me say that um, the experience in our lab, we have a, in the lab we have a, um, an assisted living studio, which is like a small a, a, an apartment. In fact, it's full of robots for assisted living. None of them look like people. Um, and the only ones that have faces of any kind are cartoon faces. And our experience, and, and, and most of the experience in, in human-robot interaction, is that cartoon faces are absolutely every bit as effective in human-robot interaction. Anyone else want to go on? I, I would add to that. And uh, we, we started out with very simple cartoon eyes. It, it is very effective. 
uh, and we've done more sophisticated uh, 3D projection systems for, for generating faces. People will engage with that just as they will with a, a skinned robot. The difference you get with a skinned robot is it works when it's switched off. And one thing I've noticed, uh, we have a robot that's sat in our, our lab, and if two people are having a conversation, even engineers who work in there all the time, they will stand in a group as if that robot was the third person, even when it's switched off. Because you're so used to that, you will treat that as a human. I don't see that as a terrible, bad thing. I think you could exploit that uh, in a negative way, and people already do. You know, this, this is nothing new. You know, we can't give up on uh, deception. The, the whole of cinema, what are you going to do with Hollywood? What are you going to do with fiction or writing? You know, the, we enjoy that. Yeah, and yeah, I, I would love to get to the point. I mean, so it's interesting, this question about do people understand uh, that characters are false? You know, like, so you, you, you know, if I asked you, you on your explicit mind, you would be able to say, you know, which Star Wars characters are dead and which Star Wars actors are dead and like how those associate with each other and you would be able to answer that question. But if you meet an actor, people tend to treat the actors as if they were the characters. So the implicit behavior is quite different from the explicit. But all we want is that people can make these kinds of decisions. And if we do get to that level of transparency, if we do an education of the population, if most people, you know, able-bodied adults that are making decisions are, are, are able-minded, I'm sorry, not able-bodied, able-minded adults that are making, that are making decisions that, that have uh, you know, legal, legal ownership, they are legal persons, are able to tell you like, whether or not the robot actually suffers if you leave it home and you turn it off. You know, if, they have, if they can accurately tell you that stuff, then the fact that they, like, like when you watch a movie, that you laugh and you cry, I mean, I don't think you can call a movie deception because of the fact that we have this explicit model of how it's made and everyone has that model. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think that people are still confused by the moral status, although that's changing now too with robots. I love the fact that at least David, I don't know if you do too, ha has his AI online on GitHub. So you can actually go and see, see how Sophia works. That is brilliant. That is absolutely one of the forms of transparency. I, um, I just, I just want to see that stuff consistent. I will say one other thing to this question. You know, Google is better than any robot. It's still AI, even though it's not shaped like a person. Mm. But that doesn't get brought up as, as the most sophisticated It's also AI. a lot more, yeah. I find the little white box with Google written above it a lot more terrifying. Um, <laughs> it, you know, there's something that knows every search query you ever typed, every picture you looked at, every shopping decision you made. No. Uh, I recently opened up my uh, location history. I didn't even know it existed. It went back 10 years since I bought my first Android phone, and I was jaw-dropped. Uh, there was so much information in there. It took me about half an hour to delete it all. I got in a blind panic. Our robots don't do that, by the way. <laughs> uh, that's that's the scary could, yeah. AI. And that, yeah. So that brings me to another question from the floor, which is um, that commercial chatbots, and I think probably things like Google Duplex, are already impersonating people via text and audio without disclosing any identity as a machine. So how ethical is that if we can have chatbots that can do that? And we, we often don't know that we're interacting with chatbots. It's absolutely the problem you mentioned before. Also, uh, gendering. I'm sorry, that was Alan that said that, that. That I think it's across the board, appearing to be uh, human when you aren't is an issue. And so uh, there's this thing, uh, Kant, smart guy, figured out that you shouldn't uh, kick dogs. Yeah. He wasn't sure about dogs' moral status, but he was sure that people that kicked dogs were more likely to kick people. Yeah. And people have made this argument about AI, and I have to say myself, here I am an AI expert that talks about this stuff all the time. I got fooled like twice by a, a, a robot calling me to sell me stuff, and now I hang up on people more than I used to. <laughs> I, it's still like this anger from having been fooled twice that makes me feel more, you know, so, so even having, there's no reason to have robots that call you sound like people except to keep you on the line longer and, and that makes it a little more likely you'll buy the stuff. So they're deceiving you and they're wasting your time, they're wasting your emotional resource yeah. um, and making you treat humans worse. So exactly. no. That's, that's a really important point. Yeah. Okay, um, so another, another question that came through. Um, which, and I quite like this one, where's it gone? If an artificial intelligence expressed a desire to look human, would that change your opinion? 
<laughs> I could write an AI that does that in one minute. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, I um, missed the opportunity to answer uh, one of the questions. I'd like to just jump in about use, uses, about use, like uh, the valid uses for human, human-like robots. I mean, okay, so we established that maybe uh, art, art and it can, be, it can be okay. I mean, it's not like a, uh, we're going to go back and, you know, we'll try to strip Abraham Lincoln out of Disneyland. That's one use. But there are more. So we had um, one of our robots uh, in the healthcare industry at the Centers for Disease Control in the United States, a, a robot called Mabel. Um, and they found that it was able to um, uh, uh, test respirators far more effectively than any other material, any other actions that they had. However, it also in the medical simulation environment uh, industry, you have applications for testing, for, for training doctors. So these human patient simulators, um, they're, they're a big deal. And high fidelity simulation actually results in better training. So having um, education with this kind of simulated interaction can be incredibly useful um, for, for a wide variety of training. And by training doctors, emergency medical technicians, nurses, other medical professionals, um, it, the, the opportunity to save lives is, is, is very, very real. Uh, so uh, basically, um, we, we are tuned to communicate with our faces. It's a very high bandwidth. Uh, data transmission uh, channel, we, and we read more data from realistic faces than we do from cartoon-like faces. It's also why it's harder to do a realistic face than it is to do a simplistic, um, you know, uh, stick figure or smiley face. Um, so, uh, but we haven't mastered it yet. So, uh, basically, learning and and studying the science of face perception is one area of scientific inquiry that these can be a very useful platform. So they're, they're and, and these, th th these are just a few. So, um, so the, we don't know exactly what uses. Um, and uh, uh, certainly one, one use is that we bring the popular awareness of AI technologies and their potential. Who knows whether they'll, they'll be much smarter than, they'll probably be much smarter than today, but will they be human level smart? Will they be sentient? Will they be super sentient? We don't know, we don't know, it's wild speculation. But on the other hand, we do know that this data is disappearing, our data is disappearing. And that's often invisible to us. So when people start to think about transparency of our machines, if we can get them to ask those questions, I think that that is actually one useful thing that human like robots can do for us. Okay, um, sorry, do you want to add? Just, if, if you're worried about not noticing when, uh, if, if AI were to become human-like, and then you have something we've already established that even in a statue makes people think, even when it's turned off, makes people think it's a human, then surely the best way to really tell if the intelligence is doing that if you, is if you get rid of those confounds. Yeah. I think the, the argument you just made is a good argument not to have uh, human-like appearance because you're trying to check, uh, you, you really want to cross a threshold. You don't want to have it too easy that, to have these other sort of indicators well, on, on human Well, for, I mean, uh, for, for certain kinds of interactions now, then um, we, can, we can pass these constrained kinds of Turing tests or lo lo like the Loebner Prize kind of test, but really nobody's really effectively done, like won the Loebner Prize or, but, um, and there's not, uh, th there are so many situations where our narrow AI can't uh, pass. Um, it's not alive. It's not sentient. It's not fully creative. And um, so, um, one thing that w that could be useful is by applying this kind of whole organism architecture with our software, our simulated physiology, with with simulated intellect. Well, people will be still quite sensitive, right? We, we, we read each other's minds uh, somewhat effectively. And, and, and so raising this, um, this synthetic being in the human family, maybe, maybe it will come to understand us. We'll be able to impart some deep values to it. Um, so we, we won't, I think, be fully fooled. Non who here has um, been completely fooled by a non-player character in a game? Like, to think that that was, uh, like, you had a conversation, you inter, right, I, I, almost nobody, right? So even though that's an anthropomorphic depiction, you're, you know, some pretty sophisticated AI, I think that um, 
that you can get a little bit of agency, people can ascribe some agency, but the, but the wonder wears off, and then there's a demand for more wonder, and more wonder, and more layers of life and complexity, um, but you're effectively then raising the AI in the human family. Mm. Okay, I, just, I want to go back to something that Alan said initially, and it's because it's come up in a question as well from the audience, and it's, is it right to refer to a robot with a gendered pronoun? calling it she rather than it, for example. So can I ask, I mean, um, will Robothespian, is it an it, is it a he, is it a she? Um, it's a lump of metal. So. Um, but try, <laughs> try stopping people from asking the question. It's the first one. If you go and stand over by the robot and listen to the questions, is it he, is it she, what's its name? Uh, and you, that's the first two questions you get. So uh, I could stand there all day and say, this is a non-gendered mm. lump of metal. Uh, which is exactly what it is, but it will not stop people from attempting to tr to construct yeah. and group out group identity with the robot. I mean, that's that, and that again is part of the problem that that we really want to do this. Yeah. Um, and it's uh, it, when when we first wrote our very first AI ethics paper, we said if only we had more experience of AI, people would get a better concept of what it is to be human. I but we were wrong. I think what happens is instead we convince people to build us things that are our images of ourselves because then we'll pay for it. And so we're actually just deluding ourselves more. It's not, it's not been but very people useful. People will assign <laughs> gender to all sorts of things. You know, if you're French, just about everything. Um, you know, I gotta say, I was in Quebec. That's a really great point. And they had some of the most intelligent conversation, I mean, of people that were really talking about AI, she's going to do this or whatever. And yet, maybe because they're used to assigning gender to not inanimate objects, they were more able to deal with the, the, the non-humanness of the thing they were refer referring to in human ways. I actually think the, the French speakers may have an advantage of, over us Anglophones. Okay. <laughs> Alan, this is a subject close to your heart. <laughs> what do you think about this? Um, you remind me again? The that, gender. Oh, issue, gender. gender. Well, uh, y yes. I mean, I, I clearly have a strong view. Um, <clears throat> um, and, and actually, if, if I want, could I riff into a, a slightly different Absolutely. point? So, I mean, I'm really, really happy to hear that David is, is sensitive to the ethical issues. And, and, you know, listening to David talk about the work he's doing, you're effectively doing experiments in, in robot-human interaction. Now, when we do experiments in robot-human interaction, we have to get ethical approval. Um, and I wanted to ask you if, if you have an ethics board or an advisory group in the company? Uh, well, we, we, to, we to discuss and question. consider ethical issues deeply. Right. Uh, we have um, friends who are uh, very strongly um, background in the philosophy of ethics mm -hmm. and robot ethics. I'm on the um, ad advisory uh, um, board for the Foundation for Ethical Robotics and I participate effectively through social media in those discussions as, as, as we have been doing on Twitter over, <laughs> over some days. Suggest. And um, so, uh, uh, yes, I mean, uh, let's, let's say that, um, that in terms of ethics and an ethical stand, standard for this. I mean, you can see yes, that, that a significant portion of my dissertation, my PhD dissertation, was about the ethics of, of human-robot interaction and uh, how this can do harm and how it can do good, uh, formal psychology uh, experiments um, as part, part of the, the process. When we are doing formal experiments, we get IRBs, and we go through the full, the, the full process. We're currently running uh, a depression therapy uh, experiment, not with, not with patients, but with a uh, general, general public for now. But we still get our IRB when we're running, running these experiments. Now, when it comes to, to arts, does Disney uh, have to get an IRB before they release, uh, say, the movie Frozen, which was a gendered, computer-generated anthropomorphic being mm. that, that won the hearts of children everywhere. And children, many children, believe me, many children believed that those beings were alive. Yeah, 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 yeah but, but nobody be, markets be, the movie I mean, as, as you know, the world's leading AI, human-like, the yeah. future. Well, we haven't marketed stuff. Sophia necessarily as the, it is, I believe, one of the most advanced platforms for AI research. Uh, and yet, um, maybe the press media 
uh, goes uh, to some hyperbolic extreme to call it the most advanced AI, but we do not call it the most, I would say that, it, that we would aspire to be the most advanced AI in the world, but, w but there are so many great AI platforms, how do you say that? Um, so the, let's just say um, the media can take it to extremes, individuals can take it to extremes. It's our responsibility to try to um, pull it back. Yeah, dispense the truth as, as, we, as best we can find the truth. I mean, yeah, then, well, actually, now there's a philosophical debate. What, what, and you said that, you clarified that truth. in a tweet a couple of days ago where you said we do get the facts out on our channels and we'll strive to educate better, though we can't control all press media. We'll keep pushing to correct misunderstandings. And I think that's what, kind of what we all hope for as well is that. Now, we've only got about four minutes left and we've got some loads of questions that we're unfortunately <laughs> we're not going to get time to get through it all. I want to ask, um, to what degree do you think this resemblance of robots to humans is acceptable. Are we okay with humanoid that have just some features? Are we okay, or, or you know, should we be stopping it before it gets to android gynoid realistic stage? And I, if I can ask each of you in turn what you feel. Joanna, well, are you? Start uh, first again? Okay, no, you don't have to. We can start with Will if you like. Okay, yeah. um, <laughs> to what degree is it acceptable to, to look like a human? Yeah. I think it very much depends on the context, and I think if it's in an arts and entertainment context, I don't have any problem with it. If it's used for deception uh, in, a, in a negative way, then of course I do have a problem with it. So it, it's really about uh, what we as people do with that technology and how we regulate that technology and how we can come to informed decisions about it. As I think David was explaining, if we can empower people to make informed decisions, then I don't see a problem. Uh, as long as, uh, as the distinction is clear, uh, then I think an engaging human form that's expressive and communicates well is a fascinating thing. It can be a terrifying thing, but in a way, it's nowhere near as terrifying as a drone with a gun on it. And that's the kind of automated AI machines that kill are the ones we should really be afraid of. And they're here, and they're now, and they're already taking the human out of the loop. So focus on the priorities uh, that really, really matter. David? Uh, yeah, I, great points, Will. And um, so uh, I would say um, that cartoon-like um, figures in some ways exaggerate uh, human-like characteristics in order to achieve um, what uh, neuroscientists would call a supernormal st stimulus or stimuli, um, basically overactivating regions in the brain which are evolved for face perception. And so, in a sense, cartoons are more human than human. And so, um, so if we create these exaggerated figures, I mean, um, so Michelangelo, uh, I, I remember in an art history class, uh, Michelangelo um, would put these hyper uh, hu human-like features, a few extra muscles here and there that just do not occur in the physiology. Um, so these kind of, this, uh, this more human-like than human effect, it drives the animation industry, bigger eyes, new, super neonate features, you know, these, these kinds of things. And um, so uh, the, the question it really is not how human-like, I mean, it, super realism may, may not be the end. It might go beyond super realism. The question then is uh, to what end? What is the effect? What are the consequences? And that's where we really need to get more deeply into machine ethics. What are the tools where we can estimate the cascading chain of consequences? And um, uh, which, which goes way beyond the um, human-like depiction and gets in, into many other deep issues about artificial intelligence and robotics and, and how they may impact our future. Thank you. Alan, how human should we be? Well, again, I think it's useful to make the distinction between arts and, and as it were, real-world application. So in the arts, I have no problem because it... it Excuse me on real-world. Okay. Art is real-world, yes. I'm sorry? Uh, art is real-world. Oh, yeah, we're not, okay. going to, we're not going to an art is real-world debate. We've only got 55 seconds left. And medical simulation is an art, right, so medical... Well, okay, okay I'm, let, me, let me be more specific as an art piece. then. Forgive me, <laughs> service robots. <laughs> So um, I think that service robots should not be android or gynoid. Uh, I, the, the number of applications I, ca I can think of for those kinds of robots in service is zero. What about autism therapy? Oh, no, we're not going down that path either because we've literally uh, yeah, got yeah. 30 seconds so, and Joanna's going to, yeah, okay. to give us her uh, opinion. So I basically thought Will was great and I don't need to say much more, but I, I, the one thing I'll say is that 
what makes it a deception is, is hiding information. And so as long as we are making a real effort so people know what the consequences of their actions with the machine is and how the machine works, then, it would ha that, then we're making people self-deceiving self having to do quite a lot of work to do so. So, so I think it's something we can, we can address. Okay, that was bang on time. So I'd like to say thank you very much to these panelists, Joanna Bryson, Alan Winfield, David Hansen, and Will Jackson. <laughs>